steal your attention and distract you from seeking God with your whole heart, shake it off. And while you're here, I want you just to worship with all you've got in you and just go with the Holy Ghost. If you, any of y'all, were to feel a word from God while you're out there in the audience, raise your hand and say, Sister Leslie, I got a word. Can I come get the mic? And I'm like, hand you the mic. Hand you the mic. So be ready to hear what the Holy Ghost says, thus saith the Lord. I'm going to turn it over to them and let them just go with the music here. Oh, 
Father. That his arms are open wide. No matter what we've done or where we've been, he is quick to forgive and cleanse us from any unrighteousness. His arms are open wide, saying, Come, come to me. Lay down every weight, every hindrance, every excuse. Lay it down. Just come to me. Come to the altar. His arms are open wide. We just thank you, Lord, for the good Father that you are. That you will always take care of us. That you will always provide for us. With the precious blood of Jesus Christ. fullness. It talks about the promises of God and it and the Spirit coming. It says, pour it out. Let your love run over here and now. Let your glory fill this house. And that's what we're believing for this week. As people are coming from all different churches, different pastors preaching, that the glory of the Lord would just fill this place, fill this tent, just Sweep over every one of us. Just fill this whole yard and property with the glory of the Lord. That people would feel it as they're driving down the road. That they would feel it from your praise and your worship. That they would feel the glory of the Lord. They would feel something that they've never felt before. Something would just wake them up. As they're driving by, they would feel something. We're saying, Lord, stir them up. This song in the first verse, it says, stirring in your sons and daughters. Stirring, stirring. This is what we're believing for. We, we sing this song, it's number 114, Fullness. Thank you. 
Jesus. 
focus on him. Just fix your eyes on Jesus. Just you and him. Just, it's all about him. Jesus. It's all about you. We worship you.
with me a minute. I don't have any of my winter clothes out yet, and I found an old ratty looking brown sweater. If y'all don't mind, I won't put that on. I'm not too proud, so. I got a word from God. I'm gonna put this sweater on. If I get too hot, I'll throw it off. right into that word because I know some of y'all have already told me that you can't stay real long I'd like to come on down here but we didn't get that lapel mic figured out by tomorrow night from Argo we'll have a lapel mic for Pastor Sam when he comes the rest of them but for now I want to get down there amongst you I can't hardly see you can y'all see me I know the light's on me but I can't see y'all well what I feel I'm going to give a disclaimer to anybody watching online right now. If anybody get, or anybody out there in the audience, if you get upset with me for what I'm about to preach, please do still come back tomorrow night because Pastor Margo, she might not make you mad. And I'm not trying to. You know me. I preach with love. But I really have a strong word tonight. So if, it, if, if you don't totally agree with me, I'd love to talk to you afterward. And maybe I need to repent or, for something. Or maybe you do. We'll, just, we'll see what we feel after this service. But, all right, here goes. I am going to come down there for this. Am I about to hit something, Abigail? Huh? There, yes, thank you so much. We don't want to pull that over. Thank you, Ab. I've been feeling God deal with me a lot about the gospel that we preach in this country. Now, I mean, I can't speak for the rest of the world because I've never been overseas much. Maybe three times I went to Ireland. That's it. But I believe that in a sense, modern religion, modern Christianity is preaching a little bit of a faulty gospel. And that's where I know a lot of people immediately wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you saying? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that all through what I feel God gave me. I don't think we're preaching the full gospel. You know, you've got churches where they got a sign outside that says full gospel church. You know, I think that's great. I don't think any of us yet or to the point that we understand everything that's written in that word. I think more and more on this journey of life, He is bringing us to a fuller gospel until the fullness of perfection of the gospel. My cousin Rocky is a preacher. I wish Rocky was out there watching me. He's probably not. Rocky's a preacher. He said, I've always wanted to just for a joke put a sign outside the church that says, we preach 72% of the gospel here. Like, you know, just Because people always sort of get this arrogance about, we preach the full gospel. Well, I'm preaching it as full as I know it. And I'm asking him that if I am incorrect on anything, please tell me. I don't think I've got it all. But I believe that in this modern Christian world, we've lost a lot of what they were preaching in the early church. I know y'all can amen that. I know, you, I know you agree with that. I think we've lost a lot of what the book of Acts was all about. Here's the good news. This is not a message to, to make you go, oh no, it's just terrible what's going on in Christianity. No, no, no. The good news is God is restoring all of that. It never went anywhere in His mind. But the church through the ages has left behind things that were uncomfortable for them. Did y'all just hear that? What's uncomfortable? Because right now if you're uncomfortable, if you get too uncomfortable, you're going to go home. If you get too cold out here, I'm not talking about if the gospel makes you too uncomfortable, maybe that too. But if you get too cold, a lot of y'all either going to get a blanket or you're going to say, I'm going to have to go on because I'm uncomfortable. We tend to run away from things that make us uncomfortable. And the gospel through the years, I personally believe, has been watered down more and more and more and more to make people comfortable. Because people don't want to see something that possibly could get out of order. When you start talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Spirit, that can get out of order. How do we know that? Because Paul had to correct the Corinthian church. Read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 and you'll see where he had to correct them because they got out of order. Did he say, man, y'all have got so out of order, we just need to stop all this now. Y'all quit speaking in tongues and no more of that prophesied. Stop healing the sick because it's just getting out of order. No, he didn't say that. 
what Paul said is, let's correct it. Let's show you the correct way to move in these things. And that's what the leaders of the church were set up for, partially, is to help keep things in order according to the working of the Holy Ghost. Now, I put on Facebook today, and I'm going to quit advertising. I just, you know what? I want to have such a move of God that people just start hearing about it by word of mouth. And they suddenly say, oh, what's happening down there at that tent? i got to get there because somebody got up out of a wheelchair. Somebody uh, that was demon-possessed got delivered. I want to start hearing about it that way rather than us having to continually go on social media and promote it. Jesus didn't need any advertisement. Wherever he was, people showed up because they knew, hallelujah, he had the power to set them free. So here's the thing. I did put on Facebook today one more advertisement. And I said, I'm going to preach unless the Holy Ghost changes it. And he did not. I'm going to say, are we preaching the authoritative gospel of Jesus Christ? Oh, in other words, are we preaching the real gospel of Jesus Christ? Oh, God. You know, we know that gospel means good news. Good tidings. You know, we go tell the good news of Jesus Christ. And we, I think we do a pretty good job with that, telling a lot of the good things, the love, the hope, the joy, the peace. We do that, but there's some stuff we've left out. And it's time we got back to it. And in some, time, in some ways, it's an unpopular message. In other words, you can have a whole crowd of people coming out to hear about the peace, the love, and the joy, and that's all a beautiful part of it all. But when you start talking about the moving of the Holy Ghost, and you start saying, whoever's got a demon, come down here and let me cast it out, you got people starting to back off going, wait a minute, that makes me uncomfortable. Makes me uncomfortable. I don't think I'm going to go back down there. And next thing you know, where you had 100 people, you might have 50 the next night. But you know what? There's going to be 50 people sitting there with a the heart to say, whatever you want, God, that's what I want. Now, I'm going to take you in the Word a few places. I want everybody, if you got it on your phone or whatever you do now, if you still open a literal Bible, which I do, 1 John chapter 3. Real short verse that I quote a lot. But I think you ought to actually look at it to realize it's in your Bible. 1 John chapter 3. And that's not the Gospel of John. That's 1 John. Alright, I'm going to read verse 8. First John 3, 8 says this, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that He might destroy the works of of the devil. Now immediately when you throw in that word devil, it makes people uncomfortable. They immediately start saying, well, I, don't, I didn't think that's what Jesus came to do. I mean, he came to spread love. He came to die for us. Yes, he came to do all that. But this, I can't, I didn't make this up. This is in the word. It says this, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. You know, we used to wear those bracelets whenever it was, the 90s. I can't remember. The little WWJD. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Destroy the works of darkness, the works of evil, the works of the devil. What are we supposed to do? The same thing. We're supposed to be moving in that same kind of anointing. But I'm going to tell you what the problem is. For one thing, we pray it, but we don't preach it. Or in a lot of ways, we don't really believe it. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Most of y'all, like in Sunday school, or maybe even back in my day, in school, we prayed the Lord's Prayer. When I was real, real little, we still could pray in schools, and we prayed the Lord's Prayer. If I said right now, let's start praying the Lord's Prayer, most of y'all could say that. But when we get to this part of it, this is Matthew 6, and you can jot it down if you're taking notes or for the sake of the camera. Matthew 6, 9 through 10 says this, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. This is Jesus telling them how to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now I looked up that word kingdom because I, I, I think I know what it means. But I said, what does it really mean when you go to the original language, the Greek there? Kingdom there means this. And this is what we're supposed to be moving in as people of God who are preaching the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. His royal power. Oh yes, I felt that. His kingship, his dominion, his rule. And that word kingdom right there technically doesn't mean a noun as in a place, a kingdom. It means the, the right and the authority to do these things I just told you about. You see what I'm saying? It means you have the right and the authority to move in dominion and kingship. Now, I think that's a whole lot of what the church is missing today. 
when we pray, you know, we pray that. Little children learn to pray that. You know, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, you know, we just keep right on with that rote memorization that we had long ago. But if we stop and think about that right there, we're supposed to be bringing the kingdom of heaven down to earth. And I felt strongly that God told me to preach this tonight. And I really had a strong feeling that we weren't going to have people come in tonight who were you know, what we would call sinners, unsaved, the lost. I really felt strongly it was going to be people already saved who need to hear this first. Oh, God. If we're going to go through the rest of this week of this revival and see a move of God, then this is what we need to hear first. If we're going to see a move of God, I want people to come in here who are devil-possessed. I really, really do. I used to kind of be like, well, we bind up those spirits right now in the name of Jesus. They can't come near this assembly. No, 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 no. God told me to change that prayer. I started saying, bring them, God. Bring them up. Yeah. I want the people who are devil-possessed to come. Come tomorrow night. Come the next night. Come on. Because the gospel, the good news says they can be set free because Jesus came to destroy the works of darkness. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Amen. And if we're not doing that, then we're preaching a faulty gospel. If we're not doing that, we're not preaching the authoritative, the real gospel of Jesus Christ because He did these things. Now, here's what I think is one of the biggest problems. We don't really know our authority in Christ. You know, there's a real popular message, and I agree with it today, about we don't know our, ident our identity in Christ. I think this goes along with what I'm preaching. We don't know our authority in Christ. There's a big difference between power and authority. I've heard a lot of teachings on this, but I've studied it out for myself and I see it so clearly now. Um, power and authority. We talk about, a lot of people are teaching now that the devil has no power. You know, Jesus stripped the devil of his power. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Jesus has all power in heaven and earth. But I'm going to tell you what that means when you go back to the original language. It's, it's more than just power. Let me give you an example. Elijah. I always use my kids for my uh, props because <laughs> I know they don't mind. Okay. Let's say right now that... Uh, let's say Megan was over there. And we see that Megan is uh, doing something she shouldn't be doing. I don't know. What's illegal? Tell me... Uh, She's smoking weed. She's, I hope she's never done that in her life. But let's say she was. <laughs> Megan's over there. How are you doing? What are you, how are you doing? I don't I, well, I don't want to show you. That may not maybe did it in my life. But anyway, I've repented. So let's say Megan's over there and she's smoking weed. That's illegal. Okay, look at him. This is my son. What are you, 6'2 now? Something like that. 6'2 and a half stretch. It. Oh, he's like 6'2. He's, you know, he's a big old boy. He's strong. A whole lot stronger than me. Stronger than Megan. Yes, he is. Your little brother. So Elijah could go over there right now and he could handle that. He could tackle her right now and get, get that joint or whatever y'all call it out of, he could do it. But if he went over there right now and said, and right now I'm going to arrest you and take you off to jail, he doesn't have the authority to do that. Unless you do like Gomer Pyle, was it Gomer Pyle? Citizens arrest, citizens arrest. You know that Josh, you watch Andy Griffith. So, we're not talking about a citizen's arrest. We're saying he has the power right now to make her stop doing that. But he doesn't have the authority to take her to jail and punish her. That He's not a cop. He's not got that authority. Do you see a little bit of the difference? Power doesn't mean authority necessarily, and authority doesn't necessarily mean power. They're, they're, they're different things here. Oh, but they're twins. They're in the kingdom of God. Power and authority are twin concepts that go together. Elijah, I may get you back up here again. But if you would, do me a favor. Get that poster right there. And let's put it, put it right here. I don't know where the camera is even looking. Let's put it where the camera can see it. That's for sure. This was not planned, but all of a sudden I had this feeling just to go make this poster when I got here tonight. So let's put it. Will they be able to see it there? Should we put it on a chair like we did one time before? I'll let him figure that out. Power and authority. There's two different words. And a lot of y'all may have heard teachings on this before. There's a power that's dunamis. You know, and it comes from the same root word as dynamite. So you're talking about, that's the power. Thank y'all. That's the power when you're talking about the moving of the Holy Ghost. Almost every time it talks, you may have to put something in front of it. Like, it's it's true. True. 
That's a good idea. Technical difficulties. Again, this was not planned, so we'll figure it out. You might have to hold it for me later. <laughs> we put Elijah in the chair and like hold some poster. Put the chair sideways. Y'all figure it out. Now, dunamis is the power to work miracles, to do to do mighty works that you couldn't necessarily do, you know, just in your flesh. That's what power means. The dunamis. There you go. Good job, buddy. Now the difference is authority is a whole different word. It's the word exousia. Exousia actually is the correct pronunciation. People call it exousia. It's exousia. That Greek word means that you have got the authority, the given right by God to make a ruling. You see there? There's a little bit of difference there. Here's the problem. And I'm not bashing the King James Version, so don't get mad at me. I'm not. But I look at a lot of different versions because the King James Version translates power and authority as the same word most of the time. Power. It's just always called power. Exousia and dunamis are the same word in the King James most of the time. Power, 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 power. But they're two very different things. And I'm going to give you some examples of that because I believe with my whole heart that God has revealed that this is what the modern church is lacking. They don't understand their authority. And if we don't understand our authority, we're preaching a faulty gospel because it's not a complete gospel to get the word out there of what all Jesus came to set us free from. Now, here we go. Authority. Think about this. What's the root word of authority? Who, who, who liked English class? What's the root word of authority? Author. Like the author of a book. So it means basically whoever created something or who authored it is the one who has the say-so. Oh, I just felt the Holy Ghost go through me right there. Whoever created something or authored something has the rule over that thing. God created this world. He's the author, the finisher of our faith. He has the right in everything in this world, and He delegated that to us. Now, and I'm going to talk about that poster, so if it doesn't make sense, it will in a second. Dunamis, power, the miraculous ability to do mighty deeds. This is straight out of Strong's Concordance here. Power, translated a different way, exousia, the Greek word, means authority or influence. So Jesus said this, very familiar verse, Matthew 28. Y'all know what's happening in Matthew 28, right? Jesus is getting ready to go away. And when he's getting ready to go away, he's giving them his last words, which are very, very important. What he says in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And man, I love to, I love to quote that. All power is given to me, Jesus said, in heaven and in earth. But that word right there, actually is the word authority, not power. He says all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. If you look in all the other versions like ESV, ASV, pretty much all the rest of them, they translate it as authority, not power. And there is a difference and it matters. You'll see why when I get through with this poster. It's never been a question of power. It's always been a question of authority on this earth. God has always been all-powerful. But, but the devil has also had power, and his power hasn't changed. When I told you earlier, people say, well, Jesus stripped the devil of his power, and I told you, no, he didn't. The devil still has the same power that he had long ago. What he doesn't have anymore is the authority. Do you see the difference? He does not have the authority to do to you what we, what we sit back and allow him to do because we don't know our authority in Christ. Now, this is when I'm going to get to the, the uh, poster here. Chess? Let me see. Hang on a second. I have to move this little thing down there so I can look at the poster and look at this. Do you mind doing that, Chess? Hi, Chris down there. He's the, he's the prop mover, too. Yeah, let's leave that right here. Hang on a second. This is a real simple story. Like if somebody said to me, Leslie, can you just tell me the basic um, story? Of the Bible. Can you just, I can sum it up right here with what's on this poster. Now, granted, there's a whole lot more in the Bible and we need to read it all, but this is the basis. There's, there's seven things I wrote here. Number one, God gave us authority at creation. Number two, the devil stole it. 
the fall of man. Number three, Jesus came to earth and he took it back. Number four, Jesus gave it back to us. We used to have it in the garden. We lost it when the devil stole it. He gave it back to us. And now we go to number five, Satan tries to fool us into yielding it to him again. Number six, we are to move in that authority. Number seven, we are to teach others to move in that authority. I believe that the modern church, when I told you that I, I question if we're preaching the authoritative, the real gospel of Jesus Christ, I think it's because a lot of times we aren't discipling people this way. We aren't discipling people to move in this power and authority. We're saying, okay, you repented? Oh man, that's key. You got to. We say you repented. You've been baptized maybe in water. Maybe you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. But all we know is you've repented of your sins. You're a follower of Jesus. And now you're saved and you're going to heaven. And we stop right there. You know, because I mean, that's pleasant. Man, that's good. That's the key right there. That you, you're going to make it on in. But that's not where we need to stop right there. We have Christians who have gone through all those steps I just told you about, and they go through life saying, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus, and they are. They'll go on to heaven, I'm sure. But they're living a defeated life. Yeah. And they're not able to effectively go out here and minister to the world because if they're living a defeated life, they don't know how to teach everybody else how to lead a life victorious in Christ because they don't know the difference between the power and the authority, and they don't know the that Jesus came and won back the authority that we used to have. Now, the first thing here, it says God gave us authority at creation. That is key. I'm going to read this. You don't have to turn to it. Genesis 1.28. And God blessed them. This is humankind. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. I've preached on this many times. That word, have, two words, have dominion, is the Hebrew word radah. Whoo, man, you say that, you just feel something. Radah means you rule and you subdue it and you have power to make decisions that affect everything on earth. Did you hear what I said? Everything on earth. Authority to affect to affect it. So we were given that kind of authority in the Garden of Eden. Adam, Adam. Hey, we got an Adam back there. Adam. Some people say it means like from the red earth. And that is one meaning of it. But it also simply means humankind. Mankind. Adam. So in a sense, we are all, we all came from that original progenitor of humankind. Adam. So he represented mankind and God's original plan was for all of us to rule and reign. And when I say it, like have dominion, that sounds kind of like have dominion. No, no, no. It's a beautiful thing. It means you have dominion over everything in a good way. And once evil came into play, we have authority now even over evil things, which we'll get to as we go down the poster. Number two, the devil stole it. Why? He was jealous. He, he hated God. We know that. We know about the fall of, of, of the devil from heaven. He was envious. He saw that God had created another kind of being. You know, Lucifer was an angel originally. And God's created this other kind of being, man, Adam. And God gave him all this authority. Can you imagine how furious the devil was? And how he sat back and said, I'm going to get it. i got to have it. i got to have that authority that God gave this this puny little human that he created, I can imagine he might have been thinking. We're paraphrasing what it could have been. Now, if you say that the devil didn't steal it, uh, he did. And at the fall of man, he stole the authority that God had given us. He doesn't have it now, but he did steal it for a time. With the fall of man, we gave it up. How do we know? Because when he fooled Adam and Eve, curses came upon the land. There were curses pronounced in the Garden of Eden, but we're not under those anymore. A lot of people are living like they're still under them. See, that's the problem. People don't realize their authority in Christ. The Bible says in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. We're redeemed. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus, not just to go to heaven. That is the key. But it, we're, we're redeemed from everything of evil that could come against us. Redeemed. But people are still operating as if they're living under the curses. And generational curses are very, very real. But in Christ, they're not supposed to exist. But we don't know how to appropriate our promises. I tell the same example, but it, it works. And I'm going to tell it again because somebody on camera has not heard this. 
We'll use Logan for example. Let's say that Logan has a, a rich aunt who died and left her a million dollars in the bank. But nobody tells Logan. So she keeps right on driving the same car, living in the same house, paying the same bills because nobody told her. Girl, you got a million dollars. Did you know you got a million dollars? Nobody told her. Well, let's say somebody finally does tell her, guess what, girl? You've got a million dollars. You can get a better car. You can get a better everything. But she never does anything about it. She never goes to get it. It's there. The promise is there. That, that million dollars is really hers. But she's not going to get it. And then you got the other scenario that says she's like, I am on it. I am at the bank tomorrow. I'm getting that money. I'm claiming my promise. That is mine. People of God. That is what the Christian world has got to cross over into because so many people don't know our promises, our authority in Christ, all the things He's laid up for us. People don't know it. It's our job to tell them. Then you got people who've heard it, but they never moved on it. Oh, I know that can't be so because, you know, Grandma had diabetes and, and then Daddy got it. And then I know it's in the line. It's probably coming down to me because every time I go to the doctor, they make me fill out that long form saying what's in your family line. That's a good thing. I'm not saying that's wrong. What I'm saying is... We've just sat back and accepted the fact that it's coming to us. It's coming to us. You know, Grandpa was depressed, and then Mama was, and I bet it's coming to me because it's coming down through the family line, and you just can't beat genetics. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. I'm telling you, people of God, that million dollars is in the bank, and I'm not talking about literal money here, although that can relate in a way, I guess. But I'm talking about we have the promises of God, but we're not stepping in our authority to take that authority over evil to say, that's mine, and I'm taking it. So if we're not moving in this, then the rest of this week, if people come under this tent and they're lost and they're depressed and they're sick, and they're oppressed by the devil, then we're just they're going to go right back out of here the same way. If we're not moving in this kind of authority that he has given us, the people who come under here, there's not a whole lot we can do to help them. We can give them that promise of heaven, which is the key, but they're still going to walk out of here in a lot of ways living a defeated life because the Satan stole the authority and we act like Jesus never came and took it back. All through the Old Testament, you know, there was no, there was no uh, authority like we have now. A lot of them moved in a lot of power of the Spirit. But there was not the authority that we have now. Let's read this. I'm going to read this to you. You can just listen or you can turn to it. It's up to you. Luke 4, verses 5 through 6. Luke chapter 4 says this. And the devil, taking him, Jesus, up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power. Now again, I'm reading the King James Version. It translates to power. But the real word is authority. Power, remember, is dunamis. This is not dunamis. This is exousia, which means authority. So the devil plainly said, All this authority will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. You see, the devil, when he stole that authority in the Garden of Eden, he kept it for a while. Jesus, even Jesus told us that. And I can give you these scriptures if you want to study them at home. In John chapters 12, 14, and 16, John 12, 14, 16, Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world. Literally called him that. Said he's the ruler of this world. See, Jesus had not died yet. The plan of salvation, oh, hallelujah, the plan of salvation had not been put into full effect for Jesus to take back that authority. God had made, oh God, God had already made a way in the Garden of Eden. There was a prophecy spoken in the Garden of Eden. Listen to this. Listen to this prophecy. Genesis 3.15 says this. And I will put enmity, he's speaking to the devil here, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That word head there, when, when God tells the devil, says mankind is going to end up basically stomping on your head. You know, if you see a snake, you know, you get that image like, oh, there's a snake. You know, i got to get rid of it. Well, that's a very good image when we're talking about the enemy here. Because the word here is the word rosh, which can mean the literal head. But it can also mean rule and authority. Oh, God. The prophecy of what Jesus brought to us was in Genesis. Right here where it tells the devil 
It says one day, one day, mankind is going to take back the headship that you think you have stolen from them right now. And that's exactly what happened when Jesus came. Now, the devil stole it. Number three, we know this story. Jesus took it back. God had to come back to earth. Jesus, the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus bodily, he had to come to earth as another Adam, as another man. The Bible calls him the second Adam. So he came to earth as a man so he could take back that authority as a man, yet as fully God. Because in the garden, what did we do? How did we give over our authority? We said, not thy will, God, but mine be done. Because I really want to have this power that that serpent just promised me. So, so not your will, God, because you told me not to mess with this. Not your will, but mine be done, because I want to be like you, God. That's how mankind fell. Jesus won it back for us in another garden when he reversed it and said, Not my will, but thine be done. Jesus reversed it. Oh, thank you, God. And he stole back. No, 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 he didn't. Satan stole it. Jesus simply took back what was his in the first place and what was supposed to be ours in the first place. Number four tells us he gave that authority back to us. Here is Mark 13, 34. Mark 13, 34 says this, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants. That's us. The Son of Man, Jesus, is compared to somebody, a man who went on a journey just the way Jesus ascended back into heaven, but he left his authority with his servants. That's us. We are supposed to be, oh, I feel that. We're supposed to be moving in this authority. Now, number five, this is key. This is the problem right now if we're preaching a faulty gospel or a, or a non-authoritative gospel. It's because Satan knows he's doomed. He knows he's doomed. He knew that at the crucifixion and the resurrection. He knows he's doomed and his time is limited. What is going to bring him pleasure in this little bit of time he's got left? Trying to deceive the church. For he wants to keep the lost lost. You know, that's a biggie. But when it comes to the church, I believe he gets a special pleasure by trying to fool us, trying to deceive us. I say this regularly. I believe he tried to steal the teaching of the baptism of the Holy Ghost out of the church like it was in the book of Acts. He tried to steal that because he knew that's a power and authority that people are supposed to be moving in. And he thought, if I can convince them, that's not for them anymore. That was just for Peter and Paul. It's just for them. Now today, we've moved beyond that. You know, that can sound real holy, but it's a lie. It is a lie. Did you hear that? We've not moved beyond what they did in the, in the book of Acts. We're supposed to still be moving in that kind of power and authority of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Spirit. So first of all, Satan's tried to fool us and deceive us. And he tried, the only way he can take your authority, you know, we say it this way. We tend to say, uh, well, the only way Satan has any power is if we give it to him. Technically, that's not correct. He's still got power, just like he used to have. But he's not supposed to have authority. The only authority that Satan can have is what you yield to him. If you yield it, I promise you he'll take it. And he'll try to fool you into thinking it's not yours anymore. But it is yours. We are not to yield even a toehold to Him in anything that the Scripture refers to as the will of God for today just as much as it was back then. Now, to finish this up, Satan knows he's doomed. He tries to fool us to yield that authority. He will lie to us to tell us that was just our lot in life, you know. I just seems like I've just always been sickly and it's just... Just my lot in life, I think. But I'm going to make it on into heaven. One day I'm going to shout with the angels. You know, we just, we, we act like everything's just like we're supposed to stay sick and we're supposed to stay deceived. And I guess my kids are just going to be rebellious. I guess ch kids are just going to do that. I guess I'm just never going to have any money and going to always have to struggle. But at one day I'm going to go to heaven. What about right now? We have authority over all these things that I just said right now. But the, the Satan, Satan will tell you a partial truth so that he can feed you another lie. He'll tell you, oh, as long as you make it on into heaven one day, 
That's all that matters. As long as you make it on into heaven, it doesn't matter if you stay sick and, and just miserable all the time and depressed and defeated and, and just never go out there and win anybody to Christ. As long as you make it on into heaven. See, there's a truth there. You are going to go to heaven one day. But the lie is that you have to stay in all these other things that you're in right now that are dark and the things of defeat. That was never God's will. You have authority over these things. Now, number six. Satan tries to fool us into yielding that authority to him. But number six says, we are still to move in that authority and not yield any of it to Satan. How do we know that? Because here's what Jesus said to us. Luke 10, 19 says this. Behold, I give unto you power. Again, King James translated it, or his scholars translated it as power. The real word is authority. The word is exousia. Let's read it that way. Jesus said, Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power. That's the real word power. Dunamis. Over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, do you see what I did right there when I told you the real Greek words? I showed you what we have. Satan still has power. If, if not, he couldn't affect you in any way. There's still a power there. But we have authority. Jesus said, I give you authority. I give you exousia over all the power of the devil. Your authority trumps his power. Some of the final things here. This is what I feel like. This is why I feel like we're supposed to hear this message tonight. And I do feel like it was supposed to be primarily. I mean, if anybody's lost, we're, we'll give an altar call here in maybe five, ten minutes. But I feel like most of us here tonight know the Lord already. I think we're supposed to hear this message. And people out there on, on Facebook, some people of our assembly couldn't be here tonight, but they're listening right now on Facebook. You need to hear this so we can go the rest of the week moving in this authority. Matthew chapter 16 verses 8 through, 18 through 19 says this. He was talking to Peter and he says, Upon this rock I will build my church. Oh God. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is a powerful scripture for what we as the church of God are supposed to be moving in. And that's why I believe that right now in modern Christianity, there's a little bit of a watered down gospel being preached. There's a little bit of a, there's, there's not a completeness here because we're supposed to be moving in this kind of power that Jesus told us right here. That the gates of hell would not prevail against his church on this earth in any way. And when we're looking at this right here, <laughs> church, if I say, hey... We're at church right now. Or y'all come to church with me, or I'd say to somebody on, on Facebook, hey, why don't you come to church with me Sunday morning? We get this idea of this, this is church. Church is a building, or it could be an outdoor tent, or right now it could be a parking lot. Church is a place where the believers gather together, and we sing songs, and we praise God, and we, we hear the word. We hope there's going to be some preaching, and we'll hope, hopefully we'll have some prayer. We'll pray over some people. That's church. You know what the word church really means? If you go back and look right here in this scripture and you see what, what the church is, the church is, is a way more powerful entity than we're giving it credit to be. The church here is an assembly of people, oh God, set apart to govern. Did you hear that? Yeah. Set apart to govern the affairs of a state or a nation. We are like a parliament or a congress. When you're talking about God's kingdom, we are like the parliament or the congress. We are set to govern. The church is an assembly that comes together to govern on this earth. Now that's powerful. We ain't talking about just singing a song or two and hearing some nice scriptures. We're supposed to be taking authority. Elijah this past Sunday morning, he felt this hindering spirit in this tent. Now, it, it was a beautiful morning, man. We had a great service. But it, it wasn't this past week. It was, wasn't it? He felt this hindering spirit and he took authority. He started praying. Those of you who were here, you know what I'm talking about. And I felt something break. I think Belinda said maybe she felt something. Uh, there are other things that we were talking about we felt. But some of us felt something break because he took authority. The God-given authority that he has. No hindering spirit has authority here. Does it have power? 
it does have power or else it could not have affected us Sunday morning. But it does not have authority to stay when we recognize what's going on. That's when we take that authority. Now, we are to implement the kingdom purposes when we prayed the Lord's Prayer and said, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. We are to implement those kingdom purposes through God's authority. And the final thing here, that's what we go forth and teach others. That's how we're supposed to disciple others. The Bible says in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Now remember I read you Matthew 28, 18, where Jesus said that He had all authority. But listen to this. Here's what He tells us to do. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. What Jesus had taught His disciples, He told them, and we are His disciples too, you go forth now and this is how you teach them to live. We've got it. We, we've got something just all, we think we got it all figured out. You know, we have an altar call, and then people come down to the altar and hopefully they'll shake the preacher's hand and we give them a visitor's card. I'm not saying that stuff's wrong. Shake a preacher's hand. Do it. Uh, fill out a visitor's card or a salvation card. Do it. Sign that thing. I think it's called the sinner's. What's that called? The sinner's something. Sinner's prayer. Pray the sinner's prayer. I'm not saying that's bad. But if that's all you do, you know, long ago, my, my mama's sitting right back there. My mama taught me the best she knew how. Man, she read me those Bible stories. She was diligent. By the time I was 8, 19 years old, I knew Bible stories like crazy. But what I'm telling you here is, she didn't know, I didn't know, until later in life, that we are supposed to be not only teaching people, you know, the, the, the good Bible stories and moral living, which is all important. I'm not downplaying that. But we're missing we're missing a link. There's a, you talk about evolution in the missing link, which I don't believe in. There's a missing link in Christianity today, but God's restoring it. That's the good news. You know, you thought it sounded all just doom. Oh, no. We're, we're not doing what we're supposed to do. The good news is, what are we doing right now? I'm preaching it. You know, I can't even see y'all. These lights are too bright. I can't even see faces. I just see dark bodies out there. That's all I see. But right now, there's people watching some of y'all knew all this stuff, but there's people watching going, huh, what, wow, okay, I didn't, I didn't realize that. You mean I don't have to suffer with heart disease? But I mean, daddy had it, grandpa had it, great grandpa even, I don't have to suffer with that anymore? You're saying that could be a generational curse coming down through the bloodline, and what I need to do is break that in the name of Jesus? Jesus already broke it, we just appropriate that promise and say, in my life, I appropriate what Jesus did, and I'm not having it. You ever see Marilyn Hickey on TV? Bible preacher Marilyn Hickey and her daughter Sarah. Marilyn Hickey had a generational thing coming down with the heart disease. They tended to die at about age 28, and she had it. She had the same thing that was coming through the line till somebody taught her. Oh, God. Till somebody taught her her authority in Christ, and she said, I break that generational curse according to the blood of Jesus. It's not coming down anymore. It stops here with me. And do you know she's still alive today at the age of probably 85 or 90? She's on up there. You don't have to stay in the state that you're in. And I'm not just talking about sinners. If there's somebody out there and you don't know Jesus, I beg you, I implore you, make this the day. And when you come into the kingdom, oh God, when you come into the kingdom, you're going to come into the kingdom in a powerful way because you just heard something preached to you that the God is restoring to the church. Baptism of the Holy Ghost. If there's somebody sitting out there, I don't know everybody stayed here. If there's somebody sitting out there and you've already gotten saved but you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost, come on up here tonight. I will lay hands on you and you will be baptized in the Holy Ghost. If you've already been baptized in the Holy Ghost but you're saying, wait a minute, I'm suffering with things that have been coming down through my bloodline. I'll help you pray. I don't, you don't even need me. Do it yourself. But if you need agreement, I'll agree with you. And we're taking authority here. Authority. Authority. God's giving. You rule and reign. You're a king. You rule and reign with Jesus. You're seated in high places with Christ. Oh, God. You rule and reign on this earth. Now, that, that doesn't mean you're rough and tough and mean. You rule with the love of God because it was His love that sent Him to the cross. His love for you is why He went to the cross and shed His blood. 
So when you rule and reign, you do it with the love of God and the compassion of Jesus that wants to do away with the works of darkness. Is there anybody that you would dare to say, Jesse, let's put this back up here. Y'all come on up and, get, and sing and we'll, we'll give an altar call. Elijah, you need to move that. That's fine. Now this is the setup. I really think this was God's divine setup for the first night of this revival. That we get it settled in our hearts what we're to be about, our Father's business. Preaching the gospel, the complete gospel as much as we know it. This authoritative gospel, the real gospel, as much as we know it and what we don't know, God, show us. Give us more, God. So we've set the stage. Pastor Margo's coming in here tomorrow night. I don't know what she's going to preach. Pastor Sam, I don't know what he's going to preach. Pastor Arthur, I don't know. But we've set the stage. And I want us to go home tonight when we leave here with our minds made up. We are going to move in that authority that Jesus took back for, for us. Stolen in the garden. But it didn't stay that way. If you don't know Him, I implore you. You can, you can get to know Him right where you are. But if you want to come down here to the altar, come on, let us pray with you. You want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You don't have to tarry for two months or ten days like in the upper room. Come on, let's tonight. If you just need to pray and come up here, you feel to come here or at your seat to say, I want to move more, God, in that authority that you've given me. I repent, God. I repent, God, that I've just been lackadaisical. But, God, I want to move in that authority, that power that you've given us. Because people of God, when, he, when He's given you back the authority, His power will back you up. You move in His authority and His power will be right there behind you. As always, the altar's open for you to come and pray. Or if you need me to come out there and pray with you, let me know. Jesus, hallelujah. There's no benediction as a rule. Be blessed if you need to leave. I understand. Go.
remember what that verse says. The first verse says, I've tried so hard to see it. Took me so long to believe it that you choose someone like me to carry your victory. But that's the thing he has. He has called you to carry his victory. Perfection can never earn it. He gives what we don't deserve. He takes the broken things and raises them to glory. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can never earn it. His authority isn't something you can be good enough for or that you can earn or work hard enough for. If you are a born-again child of God, He has given you the authority. And that final verse says, and I hope that's how you feel tonight, now I can finally see it. You're teaching me how to receive it. Let all the striving cease because this is our victory. Because it's not, it's not about you even. Sure, he's given us the authority. But it's not us. It's not about us. It's still him. It's still his power and his anointing. We just have the authority to use it. So you don't have to think about it as like, well, I'm not that strong, or I'm not that tough, or I'm not that brave, or I'm not that bold, or I'm not as powerful and as fervent in God as, you know, so-and-so down the street. It's not about you. It's about Him. It's His power. You don't have to get stronger because it's His power. It has nothing to do with your power. You are a vessel, and that is it. All you have to do is exercise that authority to then let His power see well, you're only responsible for one thing, and that's the action. You're responsible for doing the thing that He said, for praying for that person He said to pray for, for exercising that authority. He brings the power. He brings the increase, not you. So don't let the devil say to you, well, you can't do that. You're not as strong as so-and-so that did that miracle last week. I'm not nearly as holy as Peter or Paul or the characters in the Bible. It's not about that. It's authority that we have all been given equal share of. Equal share of. I've not been given more authority than, than you or you than Leslie. He has all given us the authority to do the things of God by His Holy Spirit and by His power. what he just said and that's why sometimes I'm a broken record when I talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts whenever the baptism was poured out they spoke with other tongues and sometimes they prophesied and that's different from the gift of tongues that's that's a whole different thing we've taught on that here a lot but when you're but you're when you're saved the Holy Spirit's in you but if you want to be fully baptized in it when you can yield your tongue to let the Spirit pray through you. The Bible says the tongue is the most unruly member, the hardest member to tame. So I, it's my personal opinion, opinion only, that that's why God chose that when a person fully yields, the tongue fully yields. So if you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but maybe you've not had breakthroughs lately with that praying in tongues, praying in, in the Spirit, let us pray with you. I have a gift of faith for that. If that's never happened to you, tonight's your night. You just let me know. I'll pray with you. It's key to be baptized in the Spirit. It's, it's, I feel like just God like putting it on my heart. Like that is, it is so important to just be baptized and flowing in that Holy Spirit because you are equipping yourself with so much more than you currently have. Not to say that what you already have isn't great, but when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, just completely baptized in the Holy Spirit, it is a powerful, powerful thing. And your life will never be the same from henceforth. Will never. I will never forget the day it happened for me. Never. It is so crucial in this day and time for us to flow in that authority 
We have to have the discernment to know how to exercise it, how to use it. And that Holy Spirit baptism is what will help unleash that. So don't hold back. If you're nervous or unsure, either it's real or it ain't. And it is, and it can happen for you.